it's Adam here for PC Monitors, and in this video I'm going to be taking a look at the OSD on-screen display menu system of the Acer XV282KKV. The OSD is controlled by pressable buttons and a joystick at the rear of the monitor, running down the right side as viewed from the front. The top button is a power button. There's also a little power indicator that glows blue when the monitor's on and glows amber when it's on standby. If you press any of the other buttons, including the joystick, then you get up this little quick menu system. You can see at the top there, there's modes. So these are the presets of the monitor. So there's Action G1, Racing G2, Sports G3. These are fully customizable, so they're different sets of settings. I want to say fully customizable, there are some exceptions, and I'll try and cover some of them shortly. But the idea there is you have three different presets. If you go on to standard, they're the factory defaults, or you go on to Eco, which is basically just a bit dimmed graphics, which makes various other adjustments and makes things look kind of oversaturated and weird. But if you were to choose one of these and then you make any changes, so let's say you go to the standard preset, you then change brightness, for example. It says save settings to, and you can see it's switched over to mode user rather than mode standard. That's because I'm customizing things. You then select Save Settings to, and that's how you can save these settings to Action, Racing, and Sports. So the exceptions to this, not everything is saved. For example, if you manually adjust the color channels, then that's applied universally. So you can't have different color channel adjustments for one preset or one G mode, but not another. You can, however, have some set to warm, some set to normal, some to cool, and there's some lovely light settings as well. There's HDR. If you enable this and you've got an SDR signal, all it really does is makes things very bright by default, locks off a lot of settings. You can adjust the brightness with an SDR signal, but there's very little else you can change, so it's just very inflexible. I've now switched on HDR, so it's receiving an HDR signal instead. The menu options there, you don't actually have any brightness adjustment, a lot of other things are greyed out as well. Really the only thing you can change, or the main thing you can change under HDR in terms of the picture, would be super sharpness. This is a sharpness enhancement, which over sharpens the image technically. It's, it's, it's a filter, it's not too strong. It's a fairly mild filter actually, but sometimes HDR has this kind of thing enabled by default. Some people prefer that look, and that's fine. If you do, you can just enable super sharpness. There are two different HDR modes. Auto and HDR 400, and they're explored in the written review. But basically the HDR 400 has higher peak luminance and it also enables eight zone local dimming for the backlight. And this is only something you can use with an HDR signal. It's a little bit unusual. I've found this on other Acer monitors. You have to actually select the HDR mode on the monitor when a signal is received. Usually monitors will kick themselves into their HDR mode when an HDR signal is received. So if you're on the standard setting, which I'm on right now, things just look really flooded, really washed out. I'm not sure if that'll come across on the video, but things look very faded, very wrong. It's quite clear that they don't look as they should. So if you've enabled HDR on your system and things look really rubbish, it's probably because you haven't selected HDR in the monitor itself. The next option down is brightness. Does what you'd expect, allows you to change the brightness of the screen. There's then input, so you can select input manually or you can have it automatically select the input source for you and then if you press the joystick in again you get into the main menu. First up there's the picture section this allows you to control the brightness the contrast there's black boost this is a gamma enhancement feature which improves the visibility of darker shades it's designed to give you a competitive edge in gaming set to five by default if you increase that, it lightens up these dark shades. So I've got legom.nl, the black levels test, open in the background there just to demonstrate the effect. What you see isn't actually what you'd see to the eye exactly, but it gives you an idea of the relative effect. So if you reduce that below five, things get crushed together, things look too dark. If you increase it above five, the visibility improves. It also affects the black point, so it affects the contrast as you raise this as well. So it's not a perfect implementation by any means. Ideally, it would be just targeting the dark shades other than black, and it wouldn't have an effect on brighter shades either. 
And actually in terms of the targeting with this one, the brighter shades aren't affected so much. I'm not talking about brighter shades as in any of these blocks here, but I was just looking at the background, which you can't really see properly on the video right now. But some of the brighter shades there aren't affected so much. Some of the medium to bright shades are. So it's not perfectly targeted. It's not the best implementation, but it's not the worst I've seen either. Sometimes if you just set that to six, for example, on an equivalent setting on some other monitors, then it will just flood the whole image. So at least six is, and seven to, to some extent, is fairly gentle, but there is this loss of contrast, which I can certainly notice. But it definitely gives the competitive edge, which is the main thing it's designed to do. Next, you've got low blue light. You can never switch this off. The lowest setting is standard. And the reason for that is that this has a hardware low blue light solution, which is always on. It's iSafe certified. It uses iSafe technology that's explored in the review. It shifts the blue peak to less energetic values. It decreases the amplitude of the blue peak. So that's useful in terms of improving viewing comfort particularly some users who are quite sensitive to blue light. They'll find this a nice thing to have. And I know it can be reassuring to be less exposed to this energetic blue light. It's not good to be exposed to too much of this energetic blue light all the time. In the evening, that can help as well in terms of giving you a bit more of a relaxing viewing experience. But actually, the main thing in the evening to be aware of with blue light is that it suppresses melatonin. So it's not good before sleep. It sort of keeps your body more awake than it should be less relaxed and just having the energetic blue light cut out which the standard setting does isn't really enough some people might find it is but i don't so you can also increase the blue light to various other levels there's level one level two level three level four i explored these in the written review in the calibration section as i mentioned there there are a few things one thing is that you can't actually adjust the brightness i know that it has the brightness here and it seems to be something you can adjust, but if you do that, it then knocks it back to low blue light standard. So you can't actually adjust it, it's just very preset values there. There is something else related to brightness, which I'm gonna go through now on this. So you have to scroll down on this picture setting, and there's something called max brightness. It's actually off by default. I'm not sure exactly why they've got this toggle. As I understand it, it's some sort of energy compliance thing, some possibly new energy compliance thing. I'm not really sure. So having this off by default, it will reduce the maximum energy consumed by the monitor because the backlight brightness is really the main driver of how much power your monitor is using. So if this is set to off, it just dims the monitor. So a brightness setting of 60 now is dimmer. And that includes when you've got the low blue light settings active or when they're not active. If you have your brightness set to zero, it doesn't matter if you've got max bright enabled or not, it will be at the same level, but anything above that, it's reduced if you've got max brightness off. And I actually find level four, I actually find this brighter than I'd like with max bright on and with max bright off dimmer than I'd like, which just isn't ideal. So there's an alternative which you can use and I'll come on to that shortly. It's in the color section of the menu. And the other thing which isn't ideal is that these low blue light settings, they impart quite a strong green tint, a greenish yellow tint as well. Standard doesn't do that, incidentally, but any of the other settings, they do that. And that's because it maintains a relatively strong green channel. That's not particularly unusual for low blue light settings. It's to help maximize contrast or minimize contrast loss. Because if you start reducing the green color channel, it does ever weight your contrast. So it's not ideal in that respect. But I do prefer better visual balance over a strong green channel personally. Next is ACM, which if I'm not mistaken, stands for Adaptive Contrast Management. This is the dynamic contrast feature of the monitor. That's explored in the review. But basically it's just a dynamic contrast setting which allows the backlight brightness to change based on what's displayed on the screen. It all dims as one unit. There's no local dimming associated with this setting. HDR, high dynamic range, I've gone through that already. So there's the off setting, there's auto, and there's HDR 400. Light sense is quite an interesting one. Three different levels, which just changes the sensor sensitivity. And you might have noticed earlier on in the video, there seemed to be a little blinking from the bottom bezel. That's actually an infrared LED, so you can't see that to the eye at all. This doesn't bother you to the eye in any way, but the camera does pick it up. And the sensor suite is called the Acer Vision Care 3.0 suite. So it has three different functions associated with it. Light sense is one of them. I don't like this setting at all, I have to say. And that's because I don't agree with the adjustments it makes. 
Generally, it makes things far too dim. This room is quite dim, but it's dimmed the backlight to what appears to be about 0% brightness. You have no control over what it's doing, so you can't say, look, I prefer it to be this kind of level when the room's like this or anything like that. That would be really good. Or even if you could just set a limit, so, you know, this is the dimmest I'll accept, this is the brightest I'll accept, that would really help. But without any flexibility, everyone having their own preferences, I don't really see this is a very practical option for most people. Some people might agree with the adjustments it makes and that's fine. You can, you can use it, it is there to use. Super sharpness, which I've gone through earlier. Max brightness, I've also gone through. So next there's color. Gamma, different gamma settings. These don't necessarily correspond to the actual gamma that you'd measure on the screen or the average gamma. I didn't on my unit. 2.4 was actually optimal in my case, closest to the 2.2 curve, although slightly above. But the point is that you do have different gamma settings which you can use. Color temperature, so user allows you to manually adjust the red, green, and blue color channels. So they're the gains, they're your main red, green, and blue color channels. There's also bias, which is a bit different, that kind of, sometimes called offset as well. And this sort of adjusts your red, green, and blue gamma curves affects the mid-tones. I wouldn't actually advise most people touch these at all. It can really upset the image if you make even fairly modest adjustments here. So I wouldn't do that unless you know what you're doing or you really like to tweak things and you prefer how things look with these set in a different way. For most people, just focus on the red, green, and blue gains. There's also warm, which I believe is actually the factory default setting. Normal, which is a bit cooler. Cool, which is cooler again. And low blue light, which I've gone through. So it'll just flick it over to low blue light if you've got one of the low blue modes active. There are then modes which I've gone through, they're the presets, these things. There are then color space settings. The main one here is general, that's using the full native gamut and that's just your standard setting. sRGB, that's an sRGB emulation setting which cuts down the gamut, makes a few other adjustments as well. And that's explored in the written review. And with this setting you can adjust the brightness, which is nice wouldn't generally have it set to zero. I'm not sure why it was. I was just testing some stuff out before, but you can adjust the brightness. You can't adjust contrast, black boost. You can't adjust the gamma or the color channels either because they'd be part of this menu, but you can't get to them. There's Rec 709. If I'm not mistaken, Rec 709 cuts down the color gamut as well, but it has a different gamma target and various other targets. So that might make sense depending on the workspace you want to use. HDR, which I've gone through, that's just another way of activating HDR. EBU, that's another color space. European Broadcast Union, it's not something I deal with myself. DCI, this is a strange one actually. The color gamut of this monitor is, well, I measured 89% of the DCI P3 color space, so it can't cover DCI. And when you select this, all it seems to do is essentially applies higher gamma than it should makes things look a bit deeper, a bit oversaturated, but what it isn't doing, it isn't extending the color space so it fully covers DCI because that's not physically possible on this monitor. There's SMPTEC, another standard which may make sense to you if you use it, but for most people this is gonna mean absolutely nothing. And then back to general. Next there's a setting which I very much like to use actually, color sense. And what this does is it uses that sensor suite so this is part of the Vision Care 3 functionality. And this adjusts the color temperature based on the ambient lighting. Now, when I say I like to use this, I don't like to use it generally during the day. And that's because it tends to make things warmer than I'd like. In my testing, it was around 6,000K, even in the broad daylight with sun streaming into the room. So that's warmer than I'd like then. And I also found that it fluctuated, the color temperature fluctuated quite a bit as the light in the room changed, and that would happen quite a lot in the daylight if you've got natural light in the room, you're not in a controlled lighting condition. In the evening, on the other hand, when I had warm colored lighting in the room, or no lighting for that matter, it would target 5000K or below. So that's essentially a low blue light setting. It's an effective low blue light setting, having this enabled in the evening. And also the lighting environment's more stable, so it doesn't keep fluctuating, or I didn't notice it fluctuating a lot. So. I actually quite like to use this in the evening as my low blue light setting. And unlike the other low blue light settings, it doesn't affect your brightness control. You have full control over that. You see, it does gray some things out. You can't adjust contrast with this and you wouldn't be able to manually adjust the color channels because that's what this is doing itself. 
but it doesn't impart a green tint either, so I did like this. I, I use this for my own viewing comfort in the evenings. Next is grayscale mode, and you'll notice that was greyed out before with color sense. But what this does is it makes everything grayscale, so removes your color. Six axis hue adjustment. Again, this is something which most users won't want to tweak. There's no real reason to do this for most users, but if you do need to, if your workflow or you like to make these kind of adjustments, then feel free. Can obviously have dramatic effects on the image depending on the adjustments you make here. There's reset, which will just reset all of these hue settings to the factory defaults. There's then the same with saturation. Again, this is something which you might want to fine tune yourself just according to your own preferences. As I mentioned, the color gamut of this one, it's 89% of the DCI P3 color space. There is some oversaturation of sRGB content and it tends to be the reds and some green shades which are oversaturated. So you might want to, for example, reduce the red and green. This is just an example a bit, but I don't find this ideal at all because what I find is it's extremely hard to get the balance right. You'll find that some shades appear undersaturated when you do this, whilst some others remain slightly oversaturated. So I think most people will be quite happy with the balance with this just set to 50. But if you do like to fine tune this kind of thing, by all means do. It does give you that flexibility. And I know some people do like to do that. There's reset, which will just reset these saturation sliders to the factory defaults. Next, you've got audio. So that adjusts the volume of the integrated speakers or anything connected to the 3.5 millimeter jack or you can mute the speakers or the audio source as well. And the speakers included on this monitor, I mentioned them a little bit in the written review. I don't say a lot about them. That's because they're not spectacular. They're just basic two watt speakers, two two watt speakers. Next up, there's gaming. So there's overdrive that's grayed out if you've got AMD FreeSync Premium enabled. If you're using HDMI, if I'm not mistaken, this would be adaptive sync, this is called. It's the same thing. What AMD FreeSync Premium or, or adaptive sync does is it controls adaptive sync on the monitor and that means you can use AMD FreeSync Premium if you've got a compatible AMD GPU or system or you can use NVIDIA's G-Sync compatible mode as well. If you disable that then you've got your overdrive control. As I explore in the review though, often normal, we're exactly the same. Extreme, utterly useless, loads of overshoot. So really this being grayed out is a non-issue. It just grays it out to normal and the behavior is very much as it is with normal, whether you've got FreeSync on or off. So don't worry too much about the overdrive control, in other words. If you're using HDMI 2.1 VRR, which is which doesn't use adaptive sync, it's just part of the HDMI 2.1 standard, then you don't have to have AMD FreeSync Premium enabled or adaptive sync enabled, and you can get access to the overdrive control. Next up, there's refresh rate num. And what that does is it puts the refresh rate on the screen. And if you're using VRR, variable refresh rate technology, then that will correspond to the frame rate of the content when you're in the variable refresh rate window. So I'm just gonna open G-Sync's pendulum demo quickly. So this will start fluctuating. So you'll see there, it's now changing according to the frame rate of the content. Next up, you've got VRB, which is Visual Response Boost. That is a strobe backlight setting, which causes the monitor to flicker at a frequency matching the refresh rate of the display. You can't use this with VRR technology at the same time. So it's just a static 120 hertz or 144 hertz, depending on what you've selected in Windows or the game or your system. And this is gonna cause the backlight to flicker, as I mentioned. So I'm just giving you a flicker warning in case you're sensitive to that kind of thing. My camera does usually filter it out quite well, but I do like to mention this just in case. So first up, there's normal. Um, and yeah, with, with this one, it's quite intense flickering, so I'm sorry about that. I can certainly see it on the preview screen quite intensely. And again, it looks like you can change the brightness, but if you do this, it just deactivates the setting. You can see that flickering, the strobing has stopped. You don't actually see the distinct strobe lines to your eye. You might actually be able to see them if you're very sensitive to flickering and particularly with your peripheral vision to some extent. But when you're looking at the monitor normally and just using it normally, you wouldn't see this, but you can notice the flickering. And if you don't notice the flickering, you might be sensitive to it. It can cause visual fatigue anyway. So just be aware of that. Be aware of the fact that it has a set brightness. This is all explored in the written review. And just to give you another flicker warning, I'm about to reactivate the setting, but use the extreme mode instead. 
This is just dimmer, uses a different pulse width again, all explored in the review, so potentially better motion clarity with this setting, but dimmer at the same time. And as I also point out in the review, you can change that max bright setting, you can do that with VRB Active, so it gives you some flexibility over brightness, whether you've got extreme or normal, and whether you've got that max brightness setting enabled or disabled, but that's really the only options you have for brightness. There's then aim point, which allows you to select one of these lovely crosshairs, icon one, icon two, or icon three, and that will appear in the center of the screen, as you can see there. There aren't any additional designs, there are just these three there, and you can't change the color either, it's always white. Next is OSD, so you can change the language the OSD is displayed in. The OSD timeout period, which is how long after the last button press before it automatically collapses in on itself, or you can just press that X there instead. Transparency, so you can enable a transparency effect or the level of transparency, if you like that kind of thing. I'm not really too fussed either way. OSD lock, if you enable this, it says there now OSD locked, and if you press any button, it still says OSD locked. And I'm going through this because I often get people asking how they unlock the OSD. They've accidentally locked it or someone else in the family has and they have no idea how to use it. I have to admit, I like to live on the edge and I don't know how to unlock this one. I've just unlocked the OSD. So we're gonna find out together. But usually if you hold the joystick in one particular direction for say 10 seconds, it might unlock it. In this case, it didn't. If you press the joystick in for, let's say, 10 seconds. Ah, it wasn't even 10 seconds, there we go. So you just press the joystick for three to five seconds and then it unlocks it for you. You've then got system. You can select the input, auto source, so I showed you that earlier. Wide mode. These are the scaling options, so I will go through these for you. I do talk about these a bit in the interpolation and upscaling section of the written review but I'm using the native resolution at the moment. These don't really apply to the native resolution, except there is this one setting which will do something. And that's 21 by nine, which is supposed to simulate that sort of 21 by nine style aspect ratio. You've got black borders. This is really just to give you a sort of simulated ultra wide experience. It certainly isn't a true ultra wide experience at all. And just to quickly demonstrate this, 3840 by 1600, so that is the ultra-wide equivalent of the resolution of this monitor. I've got the 21 by 9 setting active, and you can see it makes things super squished up now. And if we go back to full, things are less squished up, because they're already squished up as it's 21 by 9 anyway. The aspect ratio, a bit strange. I've now changed to 2560 by 1440 WQHD or 1440p if you prefer. So I can show you the remaining settings here. So there's full and there's aspect. What full will do is it will use, or what it's supposed to do is it uses all pixels of the screen, regardless of the resolution you've selected and regardless of the aspect ratio. So if your resolution has a different aspect ratio, it will distort things. It will use interpolation either way, and that's explored in the interpolation and upscaling section of the written review. Aspect should respect the aspect ratio. There's also a one-to-one -one setting, which will certainly pay attention to your aspect ratio, and it will only use the pixels called for in the source resolution, so things look completely undistorted. It's only using 2560 by 1440 pixels in this case, black border around the image. Just in case you're wondering, I'm sure some of you will be. If I switch over to the Full HD resolution, and I've still got that one-to-one -one setting active, it now uses a lot less of the screen space because there's only 1920 by 1080 pixels. So the Full HD in the middle of the screen, undistorted. You've then got the 21 by 9 setting again, and then Full. But with Full, you'll see that it doesn't actually fill up all of the screen. It fills up more than it was before, but there's still unused pixels, which is a bit strange. But I've worked out that for some reason, at 144 hertz with a full HD resolution, it doesn't like to fill up the entire screen. I'm not sure why that is, but it's how it is. If you have it set to 120 hertz or below, on the other hand, it will fill up all of the pixels. With other resolutions, I haven't tested them all, but I noticed that 
for example, 2560 by 1440. I was running that at 144 hertz and that was fine. It filled up the entire screen. Bit of a strange one why this doesn't, but that's just how they've done it. As a PC user, you could use GPU scaling if you really wanted 144 hertz full HD filling up the entire screen. What I would say though is that I find the softening quite extreme with GPU scaling. It's better to use the monitors facility if you can. I wouldn't worry too much about 120 versus 144 hertz though. It's not a massive difference, so I would just use the monitor scaling at 120 hertz if you really have to instead. Next you've got hotkey assignment. What this does is it allows you to control what the first and second buttons, that's not the power button, but the one below that and below that will do when you're not in the main menu system. So it was set to modes and brightness before, but if you want you can have it set to volume, gamma, contrast, low blue light, overdrive, VRB, back to modes again. So let's say you like to change gamma a lot for whatever reason and you like to change the VRB status. You can now see it says VRB and Gamma. Next there's DDC slash CI, that's part of the plug and play functionality of the monitor which allows you to use software to control it, including Asus Display Widget software which I'm going to show you shortly. Proxy Sense, I like this feature actually, I've found this a similar feature on Philips monitors before, they call it Power Sensor. As far as I'm aware the hardware is exactly the same actually and the implementation is very similar. So there's different ranges, so this changes the scan range of the sensor. So what it's going to do is it's detecting whether you're using the monitor, so someone's at the desk using the monitor, or perhaps they're just in the room if you set to range 3, so it scans further out. And if they're not, what it'll do is, after one minute, it'll dim the screen significantly, so that's going to conserve some power. And then after a further two minutes, so three minutes in total, it will turn the screen off or turn it on to standby. And then as soon as someone returns to the monitor to use it, it detects that, the infrared signature there, and it will spring back to life nice and quickly. So I like this because I often will depart from my desk for several minutes at a time every now and then, and sometimes at unpredictable intervals, so I do find this quite a nice little setting to have. I don't like having it active when I'm recording videos though, just in case it can't detect me properly as I'm sitting a bit further away usually. And Proxy Sense, incidentally, is the third of the Vision Care 3.0 feature. Best reminder, so that'll just give you a reminder if you're using the monitor for a given amount of time without a break. And if you do depart your desk, it will know because of the Proxy Sense feature, so it will reset this countdown. HDMI black level, you can set that to normal or low. Most people should have this set to normal. If you need to use a limited range RGB signal for your system and you definitely want to enforce that, then that's why you'd set this to low. PCs and most modern games consoles will use normal there. Quick start mode. This just means you'll skip this splash screen that comes on when you turn the monitor on and it will make it start up a little bit quicker. So I've turned it off and I'm just about to turn it on now. So I'm not entirely convinced that actually makes it quicker. Perhaps it does just a little bit, but it does have a bit of a startup time, this one anyway. USB port selection. This is the KVM functionality of the monitor. It's not really very clearly labeled, but that's what it is. You're choosing whether you want to use the C type, so the USB-C, or the B type, USB-B. So that's the main upstream port or your USB-C port as your upstream data for the USB. And that means you can basically share USB peripherals between multiple systems. So you'd have things connected to the USB downstream ports of the monitor. You might have a system connected with USB-C and another to USB-B. And that particular system that you select here will be used for the upstream data. USB 3.0, enable or disable that. It's a compatibility thing. I'm not sure why it was off before. It seemed to be off by default. Either way, I don't actually use the USB ports on this monitor, so I didn't really mind either way. HDMI 2.1, again, compatibility. That'll actually be set to off by default. If you want to use HDMI 2.1 and your system supports it, select on. I have that on my system, and when I'm using HDMI, I do like to use HDMI 2.1, of course. So set that to on if that's the case. 
Next is power off USB charge. This is set to off by default. If you have this set to on, it will increase the standby power consumption of the monitor slightly. And that would include if you have pressed the power button. So you've turned the monitor off with the power button, but it's still connected to the wall, so it's still drawing power. This will increase the power consumption, whether or not you're actually using those USB ports to charge. And that's why it's set to off by default. It isn't going to be a massive amount of power that it's going to use, but it's still something. So if you're not using them, you might as well just leave this off. If you do want to be charging stuff when your monitor switched off, then have this set to on. So you'll also notice there are a few little icons there. There's X, which just exits. The middle one there just gets you to the modes. There's also an I information. And what that will do is that will give you some basic information, such as the resolution refresh rate with the V frequency being the important one there that you might want to know about. The mode used by the monitor, the preset, serial number, and also an option to reset all settings. I'm now going to give you a quick run through of the Acer Display Widget software. It's a link to download this in the description of the video. It's not particularly complex software. It doesn't have everything that you'll find in the OSD. But what it does is it allows you to quickly change the preset used by the monitor, the game mode. If you press advanced settings, there's some other things you can change there. See, it takes a little while to populate this, but you can change the blue light setting, brightness, contrast. Some of this is greyed out. I do apologize, I had proxy sense active, so I'm going to disable that. Also be aware, I should have mentioned, if you've got proxy sense active, it won't let you use VRB. It does gray some other things out as well. So just be aware of that. Most things you can use, but things like VRB, you can't for some reason when proxy sense is enabled. I'm not sure exactly why, but that's how it is. But there you go, proxy sense is off. This is repopulating and you can see I can select more stuff now. And you'll see as well, red, green and blue gains, but they don't have the offsets or the biases. And I can't change the overdrive, but that's because I've got AMD FreeSync Premium active and there's no option here to enable or disable AMD FreeSync Premium. So just a few basic options here. There's also Game View Sync, which allows you to change the mode used by the monitor for different applications. And if you press Add App, you can have it scan for recently used apps or ones that are running, or you can manually browse to the app yourself, or the application. I've just changed my camera exposure so you can actually see that there are some faint grey grids here. This allows you to snap your windows to different positions on the screen easily. So there are various different layouts you might want to choose. You have to first select on here. There's also a hotkey, shift and S, if you want to quickly enable and disable this snap to feature. So there's the classic side by side. I've got two windows open here. Of course, it's very normal for people to want to view my website in two different instances at the same time. I know there's a lot of information on there, so you know it's very useful to be able to do that. And you'll see if you drag things around, it shows you where the quadrants of the screen are, and you can just snap them to there. I don't know what this G thing means. I've seen this before and I have no idea what it actually means. But never mind. And there's also this, which looks like it's user configurable, but I don't see how you can configure it. So I'm not really sure about that, to be honest. And also, if you seem to be stuck on this show preview thing, you have to press escape to get rid of that. There's then this little cog icon, has a few different things, some power related settings, you can turn the monitor on or off, power indicator and power key lock. They're grayed out because you can't change those on this monitor. Key lock, I've shown you that before, so if you ever find you've locked the OSD and for some reason you can't unlock it by using the method I showed you, then you can go on to Ace Display Widget and do it this way instead. You can have it run at startup and always on top. Check for updates, reset all settings, all quite self-explanatory. So that's really all there is to the OSD on-screen display menu system of the Acer XV282KKV. Be sure to check out the full review on PCMonitors.info. 
There's a link to that in the description of the video, alongside information about how you can support the work that we do.